Welcome to the Press Club. The Press Club has been referred to often as the Westminster Hall, the Delphi, the Macca, the Wailing Wall for those in the news business. And it is really a fitting place for the Penn Law community to meet 40 days before one of the most important presidential elections in our nation's history. We also meet in the shadows of the first National African American Museum, which opened its doors just this weekend. And at its inauguration, President Obama spoke of the hope that he had for the museum to help us talk to each other, and most importantly, to listen to each other. And it is a great day for the Penn Law community to talk to each other and listen to two leading voices that have helped to shape groundbreaking public policy and legal thought and scholarship. This event embodies Dean Ruger's commitment to advancing Penn Law's engagement with public policy and public service on the national as well as the global stage. I will be inviting Raj Sharma to introduce Governor O'Malley to us shortly, but I wanted first to say a few words about Raj. Raj Sharma is a much valued friend of Penn Law School. We are delighted that he serves on our inaugural board of the newly set up Center for Asian Law at our law school. When the three faculty directors envisioned the center's leadership, we immediately thought of Raj Sharma the visionary co-founder of Sensio, who continues to lead and grow Sensio to address critical management issues in the public sector in a rapidly changing global arena. Raj, no one brings as much as you do to good management as a central element of good governance. You bring innovation, inspiration, and insight into the ways in which economic theory can create efficient public sector markets. And that is one of your most extraordinary leadership qualities. Sensior and Raj Sharma work with the White House and federal agencies to conduct complex negotiations with some of the biggest companies in the world. And just one example of his success in the work that he has done with Sensio is the ways in which he has reorganized FCC and the entire field in a way that so far FCC has not had or not been able to achieve. Raj, on behalf of the University of Pennsylvania Law School, thank you for making this evening possible and for introducing Governor O'Malley to Penn Law School. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry we were uh, caught up in the traffic, as you all know. Um, thank you, Rangita, for that overly generous uh, introduction. Not deserved. Uh, I met Rangita several years ago at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And if you didn't know, uh, she's one of the um, most knowledgeable experts in the world on issues related to women's human rights. Uh, many of us, uh, Rangita, for many of us, Rangita has been such an inspiration. Uh, in, in terms of all the work she has done around the world to empower and create opportunities for girls and women. So for that, thank you, Rangita, for being such an inspiration. So I'd like to do a couple of uh, so quick introductions so we can actually get on with the program. Um, and uh, so Dean uh, Ted Ruger will be facilitating a conversation with Governor O'Malley. As you already know, Dean Ted Ruger uh, became Dean of the Penn Law School in July 2015. Um, as quoted in Penn Law's press release when Dean Ruger was appointed, uh, Ted is a superb scholar and teacher of constitutional law and health law. He has a passion for helping students succeed and is, some, is someone who works collaboratively to ensure that Penn Law continues to stand as one of America's preeminent law schools. Uh, please welcome Dean Ted Ruger. So now I'd like to introduce Governor O'Malley. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Governor O'Malley when he was uh, actually serving in the role of Governor of Maryland. Um, combined with his experience as mayor of the city of Baltimore, um, I found him to be one of the few governors in the country who understood a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, let's call it 
uh, management wonk. <laughs> uh, the importance of good management as a critical element of governing and achieving public policy goals. Uh, Washingtonian Magazine called him the best manager in government. Time Magazine named him one of the top five big city mayors in America for his work in Baltimore. And the Kennedy School at Harvard awarded him the coveted Innovations in Government Award in 2002. As, <laughs> as mayor of Baltimore, he put his city on a path to achieve the biggest 10-year crime reduction of any city in America. Elected governor of Maryland in 2006, he took his city stat program and state stat, uh, statewide uh, and dubbed it state stat. Any of you know about it? Some people. <laughs> uh, under O'Malley's leadership, Maryland public schools were named number one in America for five years in a row. My kids go to Maryland public schools, so I'm very thankful for that. <laughs> uh, this year, Governor O'Malley ran for the Democratic nomination for president, as we all know. And many of his policy proposals on climate, public safety, and immigration reform became part of the Democratic Party platform. If you want to find Governor O'Malley nowadays, you can either come to our offices down the street where he serves on our board, <laughs> or find him at his home in Baltimore with his better half, um, Judge Katie Curran. Uh, and Governor O'Malley also has four amazing children. Welcome, Governor O'Malley. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot. Thanks very Thank, much. Thank you, Governor. Um, and. Um, before we, we before I turn it over to you, and, and I, I know we're all interested in, in hearing your your views on good government and on a number of issues, um, I did just want to thank uh, thank Raj for your role in, in hosting us. Um, thank Rangita for her organizational role. Um, to put this in context, uh, as as my colleague said, um, uh, you know we're a, we're a law school that's situated, of course, in the original seat of government in the United States. Um, it's very important to us to be connected with policy. Uh, spheres and, and have our students and faculty and alumni engage in policy issues. We can't think of anybody better than you to kind of share your wisdom with us uh, tonight. Um, and we do want to be present in Washington, D.C. as a law school, as an institution. Um, I'm also thrilled to see, uh, in addition to our law school alumni, including some former students um, of mine, uh, thrilled to see so many folks from across the University of Pennsylvania, uh, alumni from fields like biology and, and nursing and, and Wharton and other areas. Um, this fits with our philosophy at Penn, indeed, uh, embodied in this room, the kind of cross-disciplinary discourse on policy issues like this. And uh, I know it fits with your philosophy as well. Um, and so um, I know that I and, and the, the group has a number of questions and, and would love to hear your views on a, on a range of issues. Um, to go kind of to the, to the title of the presentation that, that, that you suggested, uh, um, cutting across all issues, you're somebody who has thought a lot and, and worked hard and, and worked successfully at creating a kind of model of good governance and good leadership. And uh, I'd like to start by just inviting you to talk about what works in government, um, what can, can collectively can we do better, what have you done that's, uh, that you've found as a model that uh, others might emulate. Hey, thanks, Dean. And thanks for having me here. I, I went to... Uh, I went to the other law school a little down the street from Penn, University of Maryland School of Law. <laughs> uh, but I have a lot of good friends that went to Penn, and uh, I've met a few of you tonight that are doing terrific things and making your alma mater proud. And, I've, I've, and I also want to thank Raj, Dean, one of your uh, great supporters and boosters. Uh, Raj's firm, Sensio, uh, attracts, uh, and I should say this as a commercial for recruiting, huh? Or mm -hmm. I'm not or I'm not true to my uh, fiduciary obligations. The largest group of people at Sensio from any university is Penn. So I thought I'd underscore that. <clears throat> and uh, as Rangita said, Raj's, uh, Raj's firm is really on the forefront of, of what I see uh, as a, a new way of governing that's emerging across the country. Uh, it's been, it's only now starting to get into the federal government, but um, the, the sort of smart and insightful young people who don't accept the notion that government doesn't know, you know, how many trucks they have or that we can't have the databases talk to each other. They really do some, some cool stuff, uh, and it's important because I, I came back from the presidential experience 
uh, with a couple of lessons learned. Uh, for, all of the, for all of the distrust out there and the low opinions that people have of our ability to make our national government actually function and work and deliver results, on the flip side of that, I was really pretty pumped up to come home and see that people feel a lot better about their own cities and where they live and the level of trust and individual, call it customer service, call it personal responsiveness, that their local governments are bringing to the fore in ways that people had not seen, say, just 10 years ago. Uh, for example, almost every major city now has a single customer service number where people call, uh, whether it's a dead tree or a pothole or any of the other, you know, you, the list can go on and on of city services. That wasn't true just 10 or 15 years ago. And so for citizens to be able to receive customer service numbers and a time frame within which to see a service delivered may seem like a small thing, but it's actually at the heart of what we need to be able to do as a democracy to restore trust and, uh, and a sense that, uh, not just a sense, but to restore uh, the trust that our government sees us, recognizes us is able to respond to our voice and um, uh, when we're in need. And um, you know, that, the, this new way of governing I see emerging from cities, and maybe the reason it is, is because the services delivered by city government are so much more visible than the things that our federal government does or even our state government does. Um, but um, the, there's so many citizens in our country who feel so very alienated in this year. I mean, we've never seen anything like this in our national mm -hmm. politics, not for a long time. But I think the remedy for it is right in front of us. I mean, you can't, uh, uh, people see their banks improving in customer responsiveness. You know, Amazon, hell's bells, you can buy anything and have it delivered to your door, right, in 24 hours with Amazon. And people wanna know, why can't my government be more open, visible, transparent, performance measured? And that's the work that Raj is doing, and that's the work that makes government actually exciting to young people when they see it happening, especially at city levels, and let's hope soon at state and national. So that's kind of a, a nutshell. I don't want to filibuster up here. Well, you, I, I mean, to, I'll use your phrase, uh, you know, why can't government be more responsive and transparent? And could, can you speak to that? What are the... Uh... What are the entrenched barriers? What are the challenges um, with these very good ideas that might prevent some cities and states from, uh, from changing their, their structures? Yeah, interesting question. The, um, I, I spoke, uh, I touched on why it is that, that cities are going there first. You know, there is um, a couple thoughts here. You know, the information age has really changed the way that um, executives, uh, elected officials in executive government um, are effective and can work. Um, they, for a long time, leaders used to have a situational advantage of knowing everything like six months before any citizens knew it. But in the information age, that sort of lag time, that situational advantage over information is gone. Everybody knows everything at the same time. You know, the great uh, Shimon Perez, who uh, uh, just recently passed away, uh, he once said, I once heard him say, that he said, uh, you know, in the information age, citizens are now smarter than their leaders. And so, Part of, the, part of the reason why we're not seeing this happening more quickly, although I would submit to you it's pretty fast when you consider how recently these technologies have come to the fore, but part of the resistance is that uh, politicians and smart people in politics, and the smartest people in politics are those that have survived the longest, right? We know that. So that's one of the burdens of experience. Uh, they tell younger politicians, don't be open. Don't be transparent. Don't set goals mm -hmm. with deadlines because if you miss that deadline, they'll be hell to pay and they'll write about it in the newspaper that you didn't hit the deadline. 
Uh, but modern leaders, men and women across the country as mayors, first of all, never had the situational advantage on the time frame. I mean, either my alley's cleaner or it's dirtier. Mm -hmm. Either there's 20 guys in my grandmother's corner where there used to be two, or there's two where there were 20, right? Uh, so everything was visible. But these men and women understand that if they put themselves at the center of the emerging truth, if they're open with people about whether we're doing better or not, people will see it, and they'll judge for themselves. And so, for example, you may have a mayor set a goal of a 50% reduction in crime, contrary to the advice of all of the smart older politicians uh, would tell them, and perhaps maybe they only hit 40% or 35 but people are smart enough to know the difference between getting better and getting worse. And I think that's, uh, you know, it's just in Buenos Aires. They elected a new mayor uh, in Buenos Aires, terrific city. But he's, uh, he has about 35 public commitments. And the difference between a goal and a deadline is, or rather a difference, I blew my own punchline. <laughs> difference, between, difference between a dream and a goal is a deadline. So all of his public commitments actually have deadlines on them. And, and that's what, the, what motivates people to actually achieve. There's some other things. I don't want to totally wonk out here, mm -hmm. so cut me off at well, any time. I, I think what's interesting, this is, this is really fascinating, and it, what's interesting and to follow up on, um, in a sense, the, uh, the connection between wonking out and real data, which is uh, important to us in the academy as well, and then the way that it's often covered and disseminated and, and discussed in the context of a contentious political campaign. Um, so or not. Have, or not discussed at all. Uh, I mean, do you, so do you have confidence to take your hypothetical uh, police commissioner who wants to cut crime by 50%, succeeds in cutting it by 35%? Do you have confidence that our media process for kind of discussing those issues would be fair to that individual? I don't think that journalism has caught up with this. Um, we could have a whole discussion, and maybe some people here are in journalism since we're at the National Press Club. What do we call it? The, the, the Mecca or the, it was, it was the Wailing Wall? It was everything. I, I was bells. I could have saved the trip to Jerusalem. Um, I don't think journalism's quite, I don't think journalism's caught up with this, and part of it is, has to do with the changes that the information age has brought to journalism. Journalism has been totally hollowed out. The notion, I mean, not too long ago, uh, a newspaper would have three or four reporters assigned to City Hall. Today you're lucky if there's one reporter assigned to City Hall and that reporter has to cover everything in City Hall including the police department and other things and they usually don't stay at the newspaper very long so they lack the institutional memory that we used to take for granted in journalism. So journalism hasn't quite caught up with this yet. Mm -hmm. I was frustrated as mayor because um, uh, uh, one short story the, when I was elected in 1999, we had become the most violent, addicted, and abandoned city in America. And um, I promised we would cut crime in half. And the homicide rate was extremely stubborn. So the newspaper, in a rare example of actually playing along with performance management, decided every day on the front of the Baltimore Sun, while on the left side it would have the weather report to tell you whether to bring your umbrella or not, you know, partly cloudy or showers or what have you. On the right side, they had a chalk outline of a body lying on the pavement that my staff referred to as Chalk Man. And on Chalk Man's left lifeless arm was the number of homicides on a year-to-date basis last year, and on his right lifeless arm was the number of homicides on a year-to-date basis this year. My staff resented it. I said, they've never done this before to another mayor. I said, this is good. This means they're playing along. And uh, they continued to do it every day. Mm -hmm. But in that first year, we reduced homicides from roughly 325 down to about 260 in that first year. And it was the first time we had driven them under 300 in some 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then they stopped printing Chalk Man. <laughs> so, they, so they got bored with it. I uh, was disappointed that many of the things that I had would have hoped we had institutionalized mm -hmm. at the city or the state level kind of fell by the wayside in subsequent administrations, including how we police and train our own police, mm -hmm. or in the case of Maryland, 
the performance metrics on the health of the Chesapeake Bay, whose waters are now cleaner than they've been at any time and healthier than they've been at any time since 1985. Uh, it didn't happen by itself. It happened because we changed the actions on land. But sadly, a lot of those dashboards, performance metrics that we had facing the entire public, because if we're really a democracy, then the people are the executives ultimately, right? So we would put the dashboards online so citizens can see where we were. And many of those things haven't been institutionalized. And more to your point, mm -hmm. there's no price paid for it in terms of journalists asking, why is it that we can't tell what crime is on a year-to-date basis or nitrogen reductions mm -hmm. or those things? But hopefully they'll catch up with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I should say, um, before I ask the next question, I know the, the governor and I, and I talked before, we certainly want to welcome you in the conversation soon with your questions and, and comments. Uh, I did want to ask on a couple kind of issue areas. Uh, I did certainly, uh, as, as Raj alluded to, I, I study the health care system and the Affordable Care Act. And um, one of the things that strikes me as a scholar is even with this supposedly national health care system that the Affordable Care Act uh, uh, directs, um, the crucial role of the states, as you well know. And Absolutely. Both before and after the ACA. Um, can you talk about... Uh, you know, the, the, some of the innovative things you did in Maryland and the, generally the role that states play, even in a world with the Affordable Care Act? Yeah, the states are really critical actors in making the Affordable Care Act actually work. Um, many people in this room will know that as a nation, we pay more for health care than any other developed country on the planet, and yet our results are, are, are not the best in the world. In fact, in many cases, they're declining. Um, and so what the Affordable Care Act gives us the ability to do is to, to flip that script and or flip that um, and invert it. I mean, we should be able, in the age of information, to actually improve the well-being of our people, especially for all the money that we spend on it. It's interesting if you all, I mean, I'm from being from Baltimore, uh, we became accustomed to the notion that Johns Hopkins would always be number one hospital year in and year out. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, if you ever were to read some of those reports, Dean, from mm -hmm. U.S. News and World Report or the others that rank hospitals, you will never find among the criteria in their ranking of the hospitals what the health of the, their catchment area is. Mm -hmm. You won't find it. In our country, it's become so commonplace. I mean, it's been this way for so long, we forget that we're doing it or aren't cognizant that we're doing it. But uh, we pay our hospitals, and that's the center of the rising cost. And we have some great hospitals and really dedicated people and tremendous docs. But we align the profit incentive for our hospitals as if they were the Marriott Hotel or some other hotel chain. I mean, Mr. Marriott, great Maryland headquartered company, his corporation is profitable the more bed nights it fills up. And yet, when it comes to health care, I don't think anybody would adopt some of the, uh, you know, mottos that you have for hospitals, like, uh, we left the light on, or, you know, uh, come again. Uh, the, so what we've done in Maryland, because of the ACA, uh, the Affordable Care Act, but also because of a Medicaid waiver, and this is an example where states can be laboratories of democracy, rather than lobotomies of democracy, like we've seen in Kansas, not to make editorial <laughs> comments. Um, what we've been able to do is we've moved all 46 of our acute care hospitals to per capita payments. So now what does that mean? That means, given 30 years of experience and Raj, big data, we've had rate setting commissions for 30 years, so we have the big data that shows what a hospital made, not only last year, but the year before and the year before. And so we give global budgets, if you will, to the hospital and say, you will make this much this year. And oh, by the way, if you want to make investments that keep people out of sick beds and avoid hospital, avoidable hospital readmissions, you can share in those profits. In fact, you can keep them. And so there was an article in Business Insider Magazine, an online publication. The headline was, uh, there's a revolution going on in healthcare in Maryland and no one is talking about it. 
and it traced the CEO in Western Maryland who was one of the first to try this method. And he said, if you had shown me the numbers of our declining bed nights two or three years ago under the old model where we got paid on fee for service and how many sick beds we kept filled up, I would be running up and down the hallway lighting my hair on fire telling you that the hospital's about to go bankrupt. But now when I see these numbers, I ask, what are we doing that's keeping people well and keeping them out of the hospital? So even though their building was relatively recently constructed, they've taken a whole wing and they've turned it into a wellness wing. Mm -hmm. They pay for things now that they wouldn't have been able to pay for before on sort of basic transportation for people that don't have the transportation. Uh, sometimes nutrition, mm -hmm. sometimes even buying a new little refrigerator for, uh, and so that somebody doesn't find themselves coming back mm -hmm. due to malnutrition. By the way, malnutrition and dehydration are the two primary reasons why people who have a hospital stay come back at another, uh, another time. So that's very exciting. And uh, I think it's exciting anyway. And here's why. Because in the first year of uh, trying, we reduced hospital, avoidable hospital admissions to by 11%. Our goal was over two years to hit 10%. But in our first year, we got it down to 11%. Are there problems with it? Yeah, there's still problems. Uh, specialists migrate from hospital to hospital. We need a faster feedback loop for appeals and those sorts of things uh, for the adjustments. But it's really promising and is one of the, and uh, many other states are starting to go this way. I think in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. in fact, some of you all are looking at a model that would mm -hmm. get us out of paying hospitals like their hotels. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, states as, as the laboratories of democracy. Uh, you mentioned what some Pennsylvania and some other states are doing. Do you, as governor, do, do you, and to states generally, do you look at what states are doing and how do you, you know, how, how carefully do you kind of look at the policy uh, realms of other states and kind of actively learn from them? Yeah, your, own, your own former mayor and former governor, Ed Rendell, was very helpful to me when I was first elected mayor and elected governor. And he used to proudly say, I have an administration of kleptocrats. He said, we steal good ideas from wherever we can find them. And, and that was probably something he learned as mayor. And that's what all of mm -hmm. us learn as mayors. You know, there's no Democratic or Republican way to reduce yeah. crime or make your city cleaner, a healthier place for kids. We're all about doing what works. In fact, when I was in the U.S. Conference of Mayors, I would sometimes be surprised after mm -hmm. years to find out that another mayor was not of my party because so unimportant was mm -hmm. party to us. It was a very entrepreneurial, what works to get it done sort of thing. Uh, so we do look at each other. We do look mm -hmm. for best practices. In fact, there's an, there's an adage um, that, they, that they didn't take kindly to when I repeated this in Silicon Valley, well, where we must all genuflect when we say innovation. Um, <laughs> but I said, you know, in government, you get punished for trying something first. It's a, it can sometimes be a capital offense if you try something mm -hmm. that nobody else had done. So. As mayors, we were always fond of the adage that everybody wants to be the best at doing something second. Because mm -hmm. the R&D has mm -hmm. already been worked out. The beta test has already mm -hmm. been made. And you can tell your own staff, hey, go to Portland and talk mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. Or get on the phone with Cincinnati and figure out how they did this. Or talk mm -hmm. to Miami. And in fact, I'm leading a national smart cities initiative called Metro Lab. And they're all about taking that mm -hmm. sort of uh, collaborative approach on a national scale to city challenges and partnering with universities at the same time. Mm -hmm. So yes, we always look at each other. In fact, I'll give you another one. On the Affordable Care Act, when it first launched with the shopping websites, you know, the one we're supposed to go sign up, we failed miserably. But a lot of other states succeeded. So um, the next time around, we hired the contractors all the other states that succeeded had. And uh, Deloitte is a great company. <laughs> right. So I'm nervous to ask this next question, but as you look around for good ideas, do you, find, do you ever find them in the academy? And if so, you know, it, or put, to put differently, what, what can academic institutions do more to be more relevant to, uh, to governors and mayors? And that's, that's kind of the gist of what I'm doing, what this new startup uh, uh, collaborative called Metro Lab 
is all about. It grew out of a, uh, a report by the President's um, Advisors on Science and Technology. And it is a consortium of now 38 leading cities and their university partners that are committed to the notion that the academy, the universities and colleges, sh can and, and could, and in some cases already do, provide the research and development, and cities can be the test beds and can provide the platform for implementation. And if it's done on a national level, we focused on four areas that have kind of bubbled up from this network. Mm -hmm. One of them is predictive analytics. Using big data, uh, we're notoriously late at doing the sort of human service interventions after the fact. Uh, uh, when it's expensive and oftentimes when the damage has already been done to a child or a family. Another area is the intersection of green and more intelligent gray infrastructure in terms of the management of stormwater. Another one's uh, sensors. Uh, the development, the technology and sensors, and the folks at universities love this, the sensors on the air, sensors in the water, sensors of traffic, uh, which leads me to a fourth area, is the signalization of our, our, our uh, our uh, stoplights and traffic management. Raj, you and I both could have used that on the way here tonight. Um, we're accustomed as cities to sending Nick up in a bucket truck with a screwdriver and a timer after Mary has counted up how many times cars have gone flump flump over the rubber thing pulled across the road. So increasingly those are becoming dynamic uh, systems. So those uh, are a few of the areas that we're, um, that we're working on in that. Uh, one of the stumbling blocks is those university and city partnerships don't naturally happen. You guys have a great one. You had visionary leaders who put it together and then and leaders who followed on in that. When I first met with the president, Johns Hopkins, when I was elected mayor, he said, uh, Martin, the problem is this, that you and I both lead two big institutions that traditionally have been separated by a common footprint. So we kind of backed into each other. Oftentimes, City Hall looked at the university as that big nonprofit, non-taxpaying mm -hmm. entity w with temporary residents mm -hmm. that we had to provide services mm -hmm. for. And the university looked at the city as someone that didn't appreciate the economic value of the university and the employment mm -hmm. they create. And then we'd have arguments about the behavior of kids after big games or late nights at the bars and those sorts of things. Uh, so if they don't naturally happen. It takes leaders to pull them together. And that's what we're hoping out of the Metro Lab. We've put out a white paper on the sort of 10 indicia of a healthy city-university relationship. And the other very important thing is I think mayors have to, have to be clear about what they ask of academia. Uh, uh, research projects can be great, but if they're not solving a real problem for a man or woman who has maybe two years to deliver results at the beginning of their administration, it's, uh, it, you know, it's easy to have it fall on the low end of the priority. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think cities and universities and those partnerships are, are, are really dynamic things and uh, drive progress throughout our country, can and can do it even more, and at a faster iteration. Mm -hmm. Let me shift uh, from these kind of substantive issues to a, a different big issue, which is our, our democracy and, and the process by which we, we choose our leaders. Uh, you, you were a participant in this process uh, earlier, and I just wonder if that um, kind of getting out of the governor's mansion and, and participating and traveling the country, has how has that kind of changed your perspective on our democracy? What, 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 what have you learned from it? What uh, lessons? Uh, can you convey to us about kind of what's working and what's not working in our uh, political system? I guess one of the, I suppose one of the most humbling lessons I brought home is just how many of our neighbors feel totally, totally alienated from our own politics and our own national government. And that's a very, uh, that's a very dangerous thing. Uh, Bill Moyers recently wrote, that any people who become bored with their own politics are a people not long for democracy. A lot of our people are beyond bored. They want to break the kitchen table. They feel that their national leaders uh, don't see them, don't recognize their struggles, uh, and that their best interests, our best interests, we the peoples, our common goods, uh, what's in the best interests of our common good, 
always take second fiddle to powerful, wealthy, special interests that have everybody's ear in Washington. And when you combine that with the truth that this has been the most prolonged recession we've had this side of the Great Depression, and for the first time since World War II, we've had 10 years in a row where wages were going down. And then you layer on top of that the structural changes in, in the nature of employment uh, brought on by technology and information and the opening of markets because of the internet and the global economy. It makes people so apprehensive and fearful of the future that they feel in desperation the only thing to do is to break the kitchen table so that people in Washington finally get it. Uh, another factor that frustrates people are, is our gerrymandered congressional districts and the sense that why is it that they like their own Congress people and vote for them every time and yet we get a more and more gridlocked Congress. So all of that I think contributed to this uh, broad number of people in both parties frankly who felt that their, the only value of their vote was to protest and to send the message by way of protest that they're mad as hell and they're not going to take it anymore. Um, so that's not very uplifting for all of you that came here through the rain. On the more positive side, uh, I do think that there's hope because, uh, because I've, I saw, on, especially with young people, that they are not fearful of the future. They're truthful about it. They're concerned about it, but they're not fearful of it. And they have grown up in an era uh, where, um, you know, where, where performance management and measurement and openness, transparency, visibility, uh, give them uh, a, a sense of empowerment that I think uh, a lot of people don't have, especially baby boomers and older who are watching the whole nature of their expectations change on retirements and social security and pensions mm -hmm. and the like. I don't know if that answered your question, oh, Dean. It, that's, it, it did. It's very interesting. Uh, there's a lot I could follow up with, but if you, if you, if you don't mind, Governor, we could in, uh, invite a yeah. few questions. Um, so I would, would ask any of you who have a question. We, we have some mic I don't know if we need them, but we have some microphones circulating around. Uh, please, please give your name as well. Um, and please, please do make it a question. Uh, so, yeah. uh, yes, sir, in the back there. Hi, Scott Ambler. I'm not uh, with Penn Law. I'm okay. uh, Wharton, Wharton graduate MBA. Wharton graduate MBA. Thanks. Uh, Governor O'Malley, thanks very much. And I appreciate you. your common sense and quantitative approach to uh, uh, some of the issues of governing. My question really has to do with the experimentation and learning from positive results you talked about seems to work best at the local level. It's really not a political thing. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions about how experimentation and trying things out could be worked in our national policies? I'm particularly thinking of the Affordable Care Act, which was put together as a kludge of legislative proposals without really trying things that worked in other areas or setting up some experiments. Is there some way we could work to experiment in, at a national level that would get us out of this gridlock? Yeah, the great question. I, I think there are some mechanisms that were actually in the ACA and in the flexibility of the, of the waiver process at HHS um, that allow states to experiment. Um, there's two things that government, that, you, that are first to be cut in any downturn in a budget. One of them is training, the other is promotions. We're really bad uh, right now at promoting the things that actually do work in our government and we're bad at the same time that journalism has been hollowed out. So I do think that there are things going on in, in state governments like the example we went through in Maryland that can be lifted up and in a small circle of people that follow this stuff all the time they're seeing it. But there is an office uh, at HHS. I listened to a uh, a, uh, an interview with the gentleman there on WTOP, you know, where if we ever want to learn about our federal government, we listen to WTOP, right? Or we go to Sensio. Um, but I heard the, the gentleman there talking about some of the exciting things and the experiments that are going on. 
and the data that supports them. What we're doing in Maryland would not be possible were it not for the fact that we had a rate setting commission uh, and we had one for 30 years from when we got our first wa waiver. But the reason we went to this other way of payments was because what we had been doing was no longer working. Uh, but we had the data for it. Uh, but there's no reason why other states can't have that data too. And the technology now allows us to scale in ways that were never possible before. Um, the, the, um, so I think it's even more needed at the federal level, and, and yet the, 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 um, uh, but the visibility of it and the, and the downside of failure is also a, a little higher at the federal level. So um, I, think, um, I think it can happen at any level, frankly. I, we took it from city stat at the state level, our city level, and we took it to state stat at the state level. So we, we first were using this performance management on things like trash and potholes and also reducing crime. But then we took it to the application of the Chesapeake Bay. It was a larger scale. It was a different discipline. But the technology allowed us to go there in ways that if you had tried to do a, a few years ago, it would have been such a clerical undertaking uh, that it would not have been possible. But now it is with an immediacy of feedback loop and an openness that restores what I think is the big missing element in our democracy right now, which is trust, not only in one another, but in the institutions that are supposed to serve us. And I have some, let me do a couple more questions, or then maybe we'll do some slides. I'll show you a little okay. more what I mean. Uh, did I, Scott, would you just hand the microphone forward? Uh, if you still have it, I saw a question right the, in front of you. The yeah. mic wrangler will bring yes. it. Do you know that you're called a mic wrangler yes. in the parlance? <laughs> What'd your mother say if she knows she raised a mic wrangler? <laughs> My name is uh, Pamela Silberman, and I'm actually also not a law alum. I, I was an urban studies major undergrad at Penn, and my senior thesis was on private-public partnerships and one of the most successful, which was the Inner Harbor in Baltimore. Um, and it seems to me today that there is a great need for private-public partnerships and infrastructure, and there's a lot of capital, institutional capital, that would like to invest in, in infrastructure projects in our country, but it seems like federal and local governments aren't quite there yet. What's the, you know, what's the Im impediment to infrastructure investing in our, in our country? I, th I think um, there's, a, there's a couple. Um, one of them is they take a lot of work, and we have not, uh, you know, one of the things that Raj works on passionately is the, the public spend forum. We have greatly uh, decimated procurement officers in our governments across the country and what we pay procurement officers. And doing a public-private partnership offering is a really complicated procurement, way beyond buying pencils for a school system. Uh, in our own state in 2009, when very few deals were getting done on, on anything, we did the largest public-private partnership in history, and in that year, and it was for the Port of Baltimore to expand it to accommodate the larger uh, uh, Panama Canal-sized ships. Uh, and that one really worked. Uh, there was a stream of revenue that would come with it. It was private capital doing the investment up front. It was the benefit to us uh, because we could then spend our public dollars on not only schools but on dredging and, and some other things that do our part to keep that open. Uh, so that one really worked. You've got to have a revenue stream for it, though. Uh, and sometimes the, the drawback with public-private partnerships, I've, I've found, is that uh, uh, they sound great, but there is no clever way to build a $100 million bridge for $10 million. Someone's going to pay for it. But if you can find the sweet spot, those sorts of public things that we, used to, that we pay for, like airports or ports or, or maybe currently existing toll roads, uh, there are ways that you can you know, leverage some of those into something more. Uh, I wonder myself the open question of you know, whether the move to toll roads is, is a good thing or a bad thing for the country and Lexus lanes. Uh, I'm, jury's still a little bit out on that. 
I like the way Dwight Eisenhower conceived of it, that we'd actually have a highway system. It would be good for all of us. It's part of the underpinnings of our economy. Uh, and at the same time, when we built, uh, and I cut the ribbon on the ICC, people seem pretty pleased that it's there and we're not having any trouble in ridership and they are paying tolls. So, uh, But I think one of the big impediments is nobody, there's not yet a body of, of how to do these procurements properly. It's growing. Um, we need more people in procurement, I think. We need to pay our procurement officers more um, and stop looking at it as an expense that can be cut. Mm -hmm. Governor, I'm, uh, I'm mindful of the time and know that you did want to show Show a couple slides. Oh, slides. So I'd suggest, I'd right. say, why don't we go right to the slides? And we Maybe this will inspire more. Yeah. You've probably all seen this before. It's one of Robert Kennedy's more famous quotes. It's from the numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history has shaped. Each time a man stands up for others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. Many of us are familiar with that quote. All right? So we agree with that. And, if, and of course, we know what he meant was every time a man or woman stands up and strikes out for, <laughs> for justice. Well, unlike when Robert Kennedy said that, the diverse acts are no longer numberless. We can actually number the diverse acts. Not only can we number them, we can put them on a map. Not only can we number them and put them on a map, we can actually measure the ripples. And therein lies the, the gift of this new technology that's ushered forward a new way of governing. In the past, government was very often ideological. It was organized in a hierarchical way, you know, like a big pyramid of command and control. It was bureaucratic in its method. But Dean, with instant information, with GIS, with being able to map things so all citizens can see it at the same time, this movement is actually becoming with making leadership far more entrepreneurial, far more collaborative, far more performance measured. And, um, and actually, I think, I see, uh, also becoming much more interactive with citizens. And we're just scratching the surface of that, you know, kind of beyond the 311. Uh, we're all the smart mayors and leaders are trying to figure out how can I create better communications with people? Because the globe, uh, all around the world, the street expects to be consulted now by its leaders. The street doesn't always expect to be responsible or held responsible, but the, the street expects to be consulted. Um, this old way of governing, the best place for the leader was high atop that pyramid. Things got done on the basis of because I told you so. In this new way of governing, the only point of, of situational advantage for a, an effective leader is to put him or herself in the center of that emerging truth, where conversations are had in a circle on its side, if you will, in collaborative ways that um, uh, based on what the numbers tell us, whether we're doing better this week than we were last week. That was what city stat was about. That was what state stat was about. Uh, is the, are we taking actions that move the graph in the right direction? whether it's to save young lives or reduce infant mortality or to reduce the flow of nitrogen, phosphorus, or sediment into the bay. Uh, that's a map of Baltimore on the left that shows you where all of the, the hot spots on the homicides and, and murders where the robberies were happening. Dean, we'd, when we got 200 additional police officers, we deployed them to where the crime was happening. And believe it or not, that was a different way of deploying resources. Mm -hmm. Under the old sure. way, you would deploy, maybe if you wanted to be fair, you'd deploy equal numbers of police officers to each of the six districts. Or if you wanted to be political, maybe you'd deploy them to those districts that voted in the greatest numbers for the mayor. <laughs> but we deployed the officers to where the crime was actually happening. And every two weeks, we brought people together to ask whether we were doing any better this week than last week and achieve the results that that it, that uh, of the, the biggest crime reduction in America over a 10 year period. Uh, this is a slide from the LAPD, who was also a city that made great strides in reducing crime over these last 15 years. And um, I like this slide because, I mean, look, it's relatively recent, right? 
2012 to 2017, this was what they described as their evolution from moving their organization from being intuition-based to being evidence-based, from being question-based to instead being alert-based, to move from stovepiped information to democratized information that's shared by all, and from simply map-making to, to analytics. And this is all the stuff that Sensio, Raj, that you guys are in the center of. I mean, that sort of uh, dial-up is happening in, in, big in big and small organizations all around the country. Gentleman asked about scaling up. That, that smaller map in our state, it took us five years to uncork the various data sets that allowed us to do an objective ranking based on science of the most ecologically valuable parcels of land in the state of Maryland. And we put them all on a map, dark, black, dark green for what we protected, lighter green for what we still need to protect. That took us five years. We called it the Maryland Green Print. And um, in just the last couple of years, all of those same data sets have now been made open to everyone in every state. So you can scale that up and do a national green print. And the computers don't even break a sweat doing it. Doing a project like that would have been a couple decades undertaking in the past. But now, now it's, you know, now it can be done. So anyway, those are all, I'm not going to kill you with slides. Those are my only slides. <laughs> Very good. Um, I think we have time for, uh, for one more, for two more questions. Um, Ma'am? You're not getting any business with your yeah. mic over there, are you? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mahin Katami, I graduated from Penn Molecular Biology. Uh, Gosh, I hear that, lawyers? That's a real major. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Hey, Governor, I have to plug. So 70% of our JD graduates have a degree from another school at Penn. So uh, this is... Uh, In 1980, yeah. uh, I retired from the National Institute of Health. Um, I would have voted for you. Well, thank uh, you for your discerning and sound judgment <laughs> in Canada. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I have a big concern for the um, medical cancer establishment where the, over the last uh, century uh, we have a failure rates of drug treatment and therapy uh, at 90 percent and that's why you mentioned how oh, we spent the largest amount of the capital for health care but we have the lowest rate of a healthy nation especially the baby boomer um, uh, in, among the uh, among the um, uh, developing, developed nations. Uh, my concern is that the Obamacare and the Moonshot Initiative of Vice President Biden is being abused by the same establishment for taking advantage of the insurance and uh, publicizing the human papillomavirus vaccination. And I have raised this concern in recent publication, including my book, which is called Cancer Research and Therapy, A Scam of Century. And I have presented scientific concern why we may be creating another sick nation, the next baby boomer, sick nation. And I would very much like to raise this concern uh, before the policymakers. And I have sent this book to 
Vice President Biden. I know he wants it out of his heart because of what he has gone through to do something for cancer. Governor, can But I what can yeah. we do? What can we do to raise this concern? Because I have gone through also recently through the other side to be heard. Uh, the decision makers do not allow any independent scientific view uh, and the policy maker have no clue. By the other side, do you mean like the China Republican or Trump? Republican, uh, okay. yes. <laughs> yes, the Republican side. <laughs> I didn't know you meant like the planet or? <laughs> the, or the Republican yeah. side, whoever Whoever okay. wants to hear. Well, Let's, you sound very well versed in this. And, thank you. Um, be glad to talk with you afterwards. We're approaching a sweet time in transition, so uh, there'll probably be opportunities to bring things forward to transition committees. Thank you. There's one more. Um, uh, we haven't gone over here. One more brief question. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Governor uh, uh, Chris Jenison. Uh, I'm not a pen law either, I uh, got my MPA there. Um, uh, my question is, uh, given uh, what you've put forward and what you, how you governed with uh, data, you know, being data centric, what do you say to, or how do you push back on either those public citizens that, you know, say, Apu, uh, you know, uh, uh, that's academic elitism or, uh, you know, that, that's not really the, the right answer. Um, or politicians that, that push back on that as well as, you know, s saying, uh, oh, we don't need data. We need to, to, to govern and, and get things done, and this is how we get, get things done without looking at your, your data and your studies and whatnot. Yeah, that was, was a rambling question, but. No, 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 I get it. I mean, look, I think that's where the, the actual method of this becomes so important. Uh, it's not enough simply to put the data on a website or to put it in indecipherable columns on a website. And it's not enough just to publish it like government usually publishes things once annually in the book of inputs called the budget. Uh, Mark Morial once said to me, kid, if you ever want to hide something, uh, put it in the city budget or the city charter because no one ever reads either <laughs> one. Uh, or now put it in the Affordable Care Act. Or the Affordable <laughs> Care Act. Yes. So I, I, think, I think the timeliness of, uh, of, this, of this method is, is really what makes it uh, valuable. Um, we would we've we published the crime numbers in the city so that at any community meeting, the community association president on their own computer could punch out what's the crime look like over the last two weeks or the last three weeks, um, and to have it refreshed and to have it timely for the public is really important. But in terms of moving the bureaucracy, who's steeped in excuses like we need more money to do that, or we tried that here and it didn't work, or that idea wouldn't work here, or we're already doing that, uh, is to make sure that every two weeks, everybody's in one room with a meeting, uh, mayor's command staff and the departmental command staff, or sometimes multiple departments if you're working on things that require cross-collaboration, and you're asking, are we doing any better this week than we were last week? Uh, it kind of has a way of stripping away the excuse making if it's relentless. And if the magic dust, if you will, is the leader putting him or herself in that seat, in that center of that emerging picture and that emerging truth. It really doesn't work to delegate it to your finance department. It doesn't work to delegate it to your budget department. It doesn't work to say, I'm really busy cutting ribbons. I'll see you guys at budget preparation next year. Modern leaders have to put themselves in the middle of that emerging truth. And that's what allows you to lift up the high-performing leaders. The numbers, see, uh, give you the ability to create a compelling scoreboard. And everybody can see on the scoreboard who's doing well. And in any big organization, 80% of us are in the middle. 10% are achievers, 10% are slackers. The 80% left to its own devices without a compelling scoreboard, without the visibility to see who's delivering and how, will rock back to the slackers. But if the leader lifts up the leaders, keeps pointing to the scoreboard, and, and convenes people every two weeks 
you can create a cadence of accountability, if you will, and that 80% will then lean towards the leaders. And in that tilt is the difference between stagnation and nation-leading progress for a city. And, and that's how you do it. You have to be relentless, and the leader has to put herself or himself in the center. Thank you. Well, that's a great note to end on. Governor, thank you so much. Hey, thank you. We've all learned great from being you. with you. Thank you. Dean, thanks. Thank you all for coming.